Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's City Council meeting and Committee of the Whole meeting. Proudly call the City Council meeting to order and kindly ask our City Clerk to please take the roll. Bruno. Here. Burkhardt. Here. Clements. Here. Ruby. Here. Haven. Here. Hilberg. Here. Aladra. Here. Marks. Here. McGowan. Here. Swanson. Here. We have a full house tonight, folks. Uh, we begin our city council meetings with the Pledge of Allegiance. I would like to ask Mr. and Mrs. Thomas to please lead us in the pledge. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm going to invite uh, Mr. and Mrs. Thomas to the podium. And I just like saying Mr. and Mrs. Thomas because just, what, well, five weeks ago, right? May 25th, you were married. Yes, sir. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> yes. Isn't that exciting, Mrs. Thomas? Very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> wow, May 25th. And a beautiful wedding in Waterman, Illinois. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, this uh, young man to my right is our newest firefighter paramedic, Ryan Thomas. And his wife is with us this evening. Now, a lot has happened in the last month. Yes, sir. <laughs> Married? Yep. Mrs. Thomas got a new teaching job? Yep. Fifth grade at Hinkley Big Rock? Yes. Ryan, you've already been on three shifts. Yes, sir. And I believe the chief explained to me, what, 20 plus calls already? Yes, sir. For those of you who read the uh, papers this morning, there was an incident in St. Charles yesterday. Yes, sir. Yesterday, where uh, our, our colleagues from St. Charles, for all practical purposes, saved the lives of three boaters who would ultimately have gone over the dam in St. Charles. We responded, of course, as well. But Ryan was sharing with me that story. It was just a matter of seconds before that boat would have gone over the. Yes, sir. So you, you, you're joining a, an incredible workforce. Why? Uh, this is always what I've wanted to do. Always. Yes, sir. Uh, my dad was in the law enforcement field forever. Was that right? He told me not to go into law enforcement, so. Well, there's only that. one police officer here anyway, so what the <laughs> it's, it's all good. <laughs> Where, where, may I ask where your dad was a police officer? Uh, he still is currently in the city of Aurora. Oh, no kidding. Yes, okay, sir. Cool, man. Grew up in Yorkville. Yes. You both went to Yorkville High School. Yes, sir. Yes. Do you really want me to read the year you graduated high school? You can. <laughs> Brace yourselves, folks. 2013. Yes, sir. <laughs> This is Ryan talking here. I started with the Bristol Kendall, Kendall Fire Department in 2013 as a cadet. And after obtaining my firefighter cer certifications, worked as a paid on call firefighter for four years. I graduated from paramedic school in 2017 and began working full time with PSI. We're all familiar with PSI. With the Bristol Kendall Fire Department contract for the last one and a half years. Outside of work, I enjoy spending time with my lovely wife, Taylor. And our two dogs. Yes, sir. What are the dogs' names? Odin and Seamus. Odin and Seamus. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Irish. Yes. Yeah. We got him on St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, you love doing anything outdoors. Yes, sir. Anything at all. Anything. Especially landscaping. Oh, yeah. And it says here, tree work. Yes, sir. Explain that. Uh, just anything like tree-wise, arborist stuff, cutting trees, trimming trees. No kidding. Yes. Are you studying to become an arborist as well? No, sir, not at the moment. <laughs> Do you know who the Lorax are? No, sir. Dr. Seuss, come on. Oh, in. yeah. <laughs> Mrs. Thomas, who's the Lorax? It's with Dr. Seuss. Very He's good. save the environment. <laughs> I remember that. Failing here. Because <laughs> now your nickname is going to be Lorax. <laughs> 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 
Now, again, this is Ryan, ladies and gentlemen. I plan to spend the rest of my career with the city of Geneva at the Geneva Fire Department and could not be more excited for the opportunity I have been granted. That's pretty cool. Yes, sir. So you always wanted to be a firefighter? Yes, sir. When did you first get bitten by the bug? Uh, I was able to join the Explorer Post in the city of Aurora when I was 15. Is that right? Yep, and got on there. And then by the time I was in high school, the York City of Yorkville had a cadet program that I was yeah. able to join. And nothing else ever entered your head like, eh, maybe I'll try that? or. No, when I was younger, one of my best friends, his dad was on the fire department in Yorkville, and it was when it was still volunteer, and he would yeah. take us on calls and stuff like that. And that was just kind of like, this is definitely something that uh, I think I want to do forever. And Mrs. Thomas, did you always want to be a teacher? Yeah. You did. I wanted to do something with dogs, but I, I don't like when they die, so <laughs> I went to teaching. <laughs> Fair. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> How did you two meet? In high school. We had a well, field botany all the class. Quick, it's awesome. Yeah, she's quick. <laughs> what, what year? 2011. No, no, not, I mean, I mean like oh. what year in high school? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, my sophomore year, her junior year. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how did, uh, whom proposed to whom? He proposed to me in yeah. Lake Geneva. <laughs> it wasn't on a fire call or something? <laughs> no, no, no. It was the frozen lake. I drove out there and dropped down on a knee. Onto the lake? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and the wedding was a lot of fun? Yes, it, it was. was. Now, you yes, said there were, there were five on the bride's side, five on the groom's side, and 200 guests. Yes, sir. That's wild, man. It was a good time. Have you, have you escaped yet just to enjoy the honeymoon, what have you? That's going to be later in life? Yes, sir. That's cool. How much time off do you have as a brand new firefighter? I'm honestly not entirely sure. <laughs> <laughs> Chief? <laughs> Two days. <laughs> Two days. <laughs> After the first 90 days. <laughs> you, can go to Bristol, you can go to Bristol, Kendall. How's that? Yeah, no. <laughs> the Bristol tap. Yes. Any message... Your colleagues have returned. Uh, just prior to beginning the meeting, there was a fire alarm, and half the men and women had to sneak out. So no reflection, of course, on their warm welcome to you. Yes, sir. Brothers and sisters? Uh, I have one older sister and two half-sisters. Far out. Anyone else in involved in the fire service? No, sir. So you're the, you're the first. Yes. That's cool. What's your message for all the young men and women tuning in tonight uh, regarding firefighting and wanting to serve? and? There's no better career on the planet. Uh, the bonds that you make with your friends at the firehouse is something that, you know, can't be taken lightly. And just what we get to do is some of the coolest stuff on the planet that the regular citizens will never see. That's really, that's, that's well said. And what have you learned about Geneva that you didn't know prior to the beginning? Uh, a lot. I mean, just how the, some of the response stuff and everything, it's all seems to run very nicely and just the city and stuff. I mean, Chief Einwich and Chief Antonori and some of the other chiefs have taken me around um, just tours of the town and there's a lot that I didn't know existed, but it's a very nice town, beautiful city, and Good. we've always enjoyed coming down here and stuff for the different activities and festivals and everything, so it works out awesome. That's great. Anyone else you'd like to have join you or do we want to introduce tonight? Uh, my mother and stepfather over there. I'd like to have my mom come up. Hi, guys. Anyone else in the audience you'd like to introduce before we have the clerk administer the oath? Nope. Everyone from the firehouse. <laughs> yeah, you can't help but notice them. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> this is my mother, Debbie. Hi. Hi, Debbie. How are you? Good. Congratulations. You? Thank you. Very exciting. Are you all set, big guy? Yes, sir. Okay. The floor is yours, Mr. Clerk. All right. I think we're going to invite you to come up to the middle here so this seal is the backdrop. And come up here. You're, you're center of attention. Okay. Mom's good. Okay. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Ryan Thomas, I, Ryan Thomas. having been appointed to the position of firefighter paramedic, in the city of Geneva, in the city of Geneva, county of Kane aforesaid, 
do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the State of Illinois, the Constitution of the State of Illinois, the Geneva Code of Ordinances, the Geneva Code of Ordinances, and that I will faithfully discharge, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the position of firefighter paramedic, the duties and position of firefighter paramedic, according to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Sign some documents, Ryan. I think. Official. Okay. So if you'll sign right here for me. Yes, ma'am. Right on that line. Yep. It's a nice pen. You're all set. Perfect. Thank you Welcome very much. Board. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. It is exciting stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, item 3B this evening is a presentation by our good friend, Mr. McCready, on the Administrative Services Department. Mr. McCready, the floor is yours. Test, test. Hello. Sounds good. All right. Well, as, as was said, my name is Benjamin O'Creedy. I serve as Assistant City Administrator and Director of Administrative Services here at the City of Geneva. And while administrative services may not always uh, sound the most exciting, after tonight's hour-long presentation featuring updates to Windows 10 and the benefits of 17-digit alphanumeric passwords, we think will change your mind. But really, uh, when it comes down to it, it's 10 full-time and two part-time employees that provide, maintain, and support the processes, programs, and digital infrastructure that allows a dynamic and complex organization like the City of Geneva to operate 24 hours a day. Administrative services is comprised of three divisions, finance, HR, and the focus of tonight's presentation, information technology. Led by Pete Collins, often known as the man in the booth, the division is responsible for providing everything from help desk support, live streaming video, digital security, telephones, email, software, and more. IT is more than a help desk solution here at the City of Geneva. Amongst other things, the division and Pete help guide decisions about our investments in technology, ensure that our employees have the digital tools and resources they need, and provide support to the city's citywide efforts to implement our strategic plan. And the year ahead, Pete, Administrative Services and the IT Division will be working on projects that will help facilitate the delivery of excellent municipal services and uphold our commitment to environmental stewardship. So as we become increasingly data driven, Pete and his team are key players in helping us prepare for the future. So before I say any more though, I would like to invite Pete to come out of the booth and join me up here. And he's prepared a wonderful presentation that I think will give you a little more insight as far as the scope staff and services that he and his team help provide every day here at the city of geneva so with that take it away pete so it's been about i think five years since last time we did one of these so most of you probably haven't seen this before so that's pretty good um again uh we're kind of more of a back-end thing if you understand if we're, when we're doing our job you don't know that we're there and that's kind of what we like about IT the most. Uh, if you're calling me, there's a problem, and that means that things are not working correctly and not working right, so we're not doing our job. So ideally, you don't even know we're there. Um, basically, we have three people total. Uh, few of you might have met our, our video operator, Parker. Parker is here for uh, HPC meetings and plan commission meetings, uh, to just basically just to film the meetings themselves. Um, He's only part-time, um, but uh, he's brought our, uh, the coverage of the other meetings that we didn't used to be able to broadcast uh, out into the forefront. Um, secondly is uh, our IT analyst, Mitch Radman. Uh, 
Mitch has been here since 2014. Um, he basically touches close to everything here as well as I do. Um, he'll deal with desktops and servers and, and our, our Wi-Fi uh, infrastructure. Um, kind of one of his uh, most important jobs though that he does is he's a, uh, he's a member of the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. So he kind of got dragged into this by the police department and they were looking for someone in IT to help them chase down people who were you know, pedophiles and ch people who harass children. So he got dragged into a larger scale of things with uh, not only with Cook County and uh, uh, with DHS and ICE where they've gone out on raids in McHenry County trying to trace down some of these people. So he's really gotten a nice jump into other directions. He's found a niche that he enjoys and uh, so that helps us stay in touch with, with what's going on around here too. As far as myself, um, I deal with most of <laughs> pretty much everything here. Uh, I've been here since 1999. Um, everything you pretty much see here has started with me, uh, which is good and bad at the same time. That's why I like having Mitch around to say, eh, that's been there too long, it's time to move on. We need to change this. Uh, but basically anything to do with our, our internet access, our mail servers, our phone systems, our, uh, a policy, our telecommunication, the telecommunications policy, uh, our cable franchising, a lot of that all goes through me. So I will try not to bore you through a lot of this stuff. I realize it's not too exciting, it's IT. So um, one thing I'm, I'm going to say up front, though, that really makes my life a lot easier is the fact that we have this municipal fiber network as a result of our electric utility. Um, a lot of cities struggle with connectivity from building to building and point to point schools and stuff and we just don't have that problem because we have this robust fiber backbone that where other people run into bandwidth issues, we just don't have that. We can deploy some of the neatest toys out there simply because we have a great relationship with our electric division um, and public works, it really just makes our life a lot easier. So we're in an advantage. Cities with municipal electric are really are in an advantage in this. Um, but brief overview, uh, long and short, lots of machines, 100, you know, basically 150 user machines, uh, mobile, laptop servers. We have, we have machines in squads, um, all the desktops around the city. Um, our, our uh, voice over IP phone system, again, made possible by the fact that we have this nice, robust fiber backbone. We don't run into bandwidth issues. We can do things that a lot of other people can't. Um, and a lot of mobile devices at this point, both cell phones and iPads. Uh, iPads especially more and more. Fire uses them a lot now in the squads or in, the, in their trucks. Um, but also our GIS people and our electric utilities and our water utilities are using these so they can access GIS data in the field. Really leaps and bounds of where it's at. Mail, internet access, basic stuff like that. Um, all of our back end as far as our fiber optic gear, our switches, our routers, our firewalls, access points in the ceilings. Um, what we're doing right now, uh, council meetings, broadcast stuff, all of the stuff that we put on YouTube, all of the uh, fun things that I get to go do with the mayor. I get to be the guy again behind the scene. He gets to be the ham out front. It works just fine. That's where we like IT to be. If you're seeing us, we'd prefer that you don't. So we prefer to be behind the camera than out front. Um, hence the fact that all anybody's seeing on TV right now is this and not me. So um, also, Franchise negotiations and compliance. Stephanie and I uh, cut our teeth together when she started here on uh, cable franchise joy with uh, Comcast and AT&T. It's a long and tedious process. I'm uh, thankful for the fact that we have an in-house lawyer at times who can say this is good to see, um, but it's really crucial to how our citizens are treated in town um, when things don't go the right way. If you know any of our past, if you've been in town long enough, you know we've had some fun occasions with both Comcast and AT&T. Thankfully, most of that has died down these days. Um, and finally, telecommunications legislation on both the state and federal level. Um, IT keeps track of that as much as we can. We look for changes that affect our rights of ways, primarily. That's our biggest concern. 
Um, so some projects since our last update, which was again, 2014. Uh, all of the video equipment you see in this room and most of the stuff in the closet back there, we went from our uh, SD configuration, standard definition to our HD broadcast system now. Uh, hopefully someday we'll be able to actually broadcast in HD, not just to YouTube, but actually to Channel 10 and, and, and to uh, AT&T Uverse. I believe once uh, um, our new provider in town goes online, that will, I believe that will be an HD feed out to them. So um, let's see, uh, what else? Redundant fiber pass to our EOC. Uh, as you probably know, our EOC is at uh, fire station headquarters over on Eastside Drive. Uh, when we first built this network in 2003, we had a single path that basically got us from here over to there. And as Hal can attest to, we fought squirrels quite a bit who had a taste for fiber. We would lose the EOC because squirrels get hungry. Uh, We've since then, with our negotiations and our agreements with Kane County and also with some private telco providers, uh, negotiated alternate paths at redundant paths. So we have via Kane County, via the ice arena, another path in that way. We also, with uh, I believe it's Wide Open West, have a pair of fiber now that run down 38. All that come back to our head end here in the police station. So uh, police station, the second floor of the police station is basically the brains of our entire network. That's where it's at. Um, let's see, what else? Our ERP software. So 2014, we would have just started. 2012? Yes, okay. So since then, we've got, uh, we've done multiple machine upgrades uh, to our ERP path where we've had to upgrade from operating system to operating system, take it out, reinstall it, move it. Uh, for those of you who are, are unaware of this, uh, our ERP New World, Tyler at this point, uh, we actually lease space on Kane County servers so we can get this off site. What we are primary, since we have this nice fiber optic network, uh, we can actually connect to the county as fast as we can connect across the street. So we actually, for our, for the redundancy for all of the ERP software, for our utility billing, for our HR, we decided it was a better idea to put it on the county's back end. So not only do we have a redundant path to that, they also have redundant backups of their system both. Well, they've got one here down at the Judicial Center. Uh, I'm sorry, Government Center here, Judicial Center out here. And now they're also pushing half of their back end or a third of their back end out into a data center. There's a new data center out at uh, EOLA in 88. If you probably drive by it, big, huge data center. They're actually moving some of their data center into there too. So things that are most important to me, are the finances, we need to keep money coming in, we need to be able to pay people. We don't want it on site. We want it off site somewhere else with a, a scale that can be backed up easier uh, than we can do it with our finances. Um, various security audits. So every time we go through an insurance renewal, we get audited. Every time we go through our auditors, we get audited. Uh, anytime we do anything for, uh, we've moved our, our security standards to FBI standards for passwords and logins specifically to accommodate the police departments because it's easier to just to deal with it on a global level than it is to niche it out and say only the cops have to do this and everybody else does something else. So we moved to that level on that. Um, the audits are always telling. Uh, you're always, you know, no matter how good you are, you're always learning something that you could be doing better. And, uh, and while I won't go into that stuff, let's just say we're in a fairly decent space, uh, but it's always good to have someone else tell you what you're doing wrong without a doubt, you're gonna find holes, so. Uh, our data center, let's see. We moved our data center out of this building into, again, the uh, public safety building across the street. Simply, among other reasons, one, it's more secure. Two, it's got a better generator. Three, um, it's more energy efficient just to keep our servers cool. That's really the biggest part of it. Um, and, you know, tied in with that, uh, we've replaced most of our network switches around the city for the same reason. We cut, it used to be, you know, you'd get like a 24 port switch and we power all the phones and stuff like that. We move everything to 48 port switches. We use less energy, less heat in the closet. So it, it just makes life more efficient and faster at the same time. Um, 
getting into smaller stuff, various conference rooms, you know, we put in this conference room here as a prime example of what we're trying to do. We did one at Public Works too, where we have a large screen TV, uh, video conferencing system, a PC all connected to that. It's kind of our standard, what we're trying to do across all of the conference rooms in the city so they can all be used for that kind of thing. So if you ever actually take a look at the system that's in there, it's pretty basic, but it really does a great job for doing video conferencing and Skype conferencing, that kind of stuff. So. Um, Unification of security systems. So you all have door passes to get in this building. Not all of these buildings were on the same system. They were all on various systems. We've consolidated them all. Um, we've actually got two locations left. Uh, fire station headquarters comes on at the end of this year. And in next budget year, the wastewater treatment facility will also be on as they redo the gates there. So all of these places are based on this little key card that you all hold in here. So I can say you have access to this door and this door, but not this door and that door. So it's really nice uh, and easy. Again, not here when we started. So upcoming, basically basic stuff, right? We roll out a uh, quarter of our machines and servers every year. We try to always be moving a quarter all the time so we aren't laying out large sums of cash. We always want to be moving 25%. If we can do it, as long as the finance, as long as the money is there, we do it. We've been in some places in the past. For those of you who have been here longer, where we've put that stuff off for a long time, and then we come in and get slammed <laughs> with a large recurrence of, of, of upgrading machines. But typically, we move on a uh, on a quarterly or 25 percent a year. Um, on our ERP system, we're rolling out new services uh, within this year to start doing things that seem really basic, but uh, e-timesheets for all the employees, uh, e-benefits so they can log in and change their W-2s and their, you know, and their benefit project. They can try different insurance stuff. This is all coming along in the future. Requires some updates to our ERP system still, but that's the plan we're going on. Um, assistance to other division initiatives. So uh, there's, a, there's a fun one right now that I'm, I'm working with Electric on a little bit, and they have been working on this, uh, this program called Millsoft, which ties their electric utility to the geographic information that's in GIS files. So GIS files, if you don't know, think of it this way, smart maps, right? So maps that you can click from one end to the other and say, if I go from here to here, how long is that? Or which way is the flow going? Or that kind of thing, okay? So they spent a lot of time upgrading the electric GIS information so they had that information embedded in there. So now this software takes it and marries it with their SCADA information where outages are so they can actually see on the maps when something goes out where it goes out. They're still in a stage with that. The fun part that they're doing right now is they're also adding AVL, audio, <laughs> uh, automobile vehicle locator service so they can, once that's in, take Verizon data from devices in the, in the trucks, locates it on the map, says where they're at, pops up on the map. You get a big screen like this, you say, okay, here's my electric utility, what's broken where, okay, I can see where it's at, blah, blah, blah. So a lot of back end work, you know, I'm not, I'm not an electric guy, but I like the back end of things, so it's fun. Um, and probably the biggest one that you all know is, uh, you know, ongoing end user training, right? So the weakest point we have in any location is end users. And the best way that we, can, that we can work with our end users is to keep continuing to say, hey, if you got a question, ask. If you got a question, ask. If it looks flaky, ask. If, you don't, if, you're, not, if you're concerned about it, delete it or ask. You can always, you can always, you can always get it back again. Um, this, I'm sure you've all seen in the news lately, of uh, the Florida municipalities and, and Baltimore and anybody else who's getting these things. Um, it comes down to an end user clicking something they shouldn't have clicked. And you can only, we can only dumb down our system so much to block that kind of thing. So there, we, there is some inherent risk. And the way we get around that is we just encourage people to talk to us, right? I don't care if you call me and say, I don't understand this. Call me and talk to me because that's why we're here, you know? So. We do, I think we do pretty well on that end of things. People aren't afraid to ask us. I know in other entities, uh, there's a lot more locking down and a lot more inability for end users to do their jobs. And if we lock this down too much, then end users can't do their jobs. And if you ask, just ask, it's never a stupid question, just ask. Because that's why we're here. That's what you pay us to do, to know what is what. So. Um, 
let's see, what else was in there? So, and, 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 you know, and again, the way we go through a lot of this stuff, and uh, again, not trying to beat a dead horse here and bore you to death with geek stuff, but how we go about making our network safe, uh, you know, it's, it's a multi, it's a multi-piece uh, way of doing it. We do it with our, our network design, how we, uh, what networks can see what networks. So, you know, our data network that we sit on here to do this can't see our water networks. They can't get there. Uh, so we do it with hardware design. We do it with network monitoring tools. Uh, we have now currently a box that scans every bit of data that runs across our networks and alerts us when it sees something goofy. It literally scans all traffic. Everything going in and out of here, we see. Um, antivirus on the desktops. We, you know, use a proactive approach on the antivirus on the desktops where we block sites. We don't allow anybody to go anywhere they want unless they have admin rights or, or their cops doing an investigation or whatever their deal is. We block stuff. And, you know, and then probably most importantly on a daily basis, I mean, you guys have to deal with this too, is all the anti-spam stuff, right? We kill ridiculous amounts of spam. Um, <laughs> it almost makes, I mean, you hear lots of people saying mail is, you know, is not almost not worth it. And it's, it's pretty damn close to that. Um, I'll just to give you an example here. So this is kind of small, but I'll give you a bigger one on the next page. So looking at this, right? So this, is, uh, this was an email stat for one, basically to a certain point in time. Within that day, what did I say this? This is like 11 o'clock in the morning here. We had gotten, we had received a total of, uh, okay, so here, a total of, a total, a total receive on that hour, we'd received total 267 and we had allowed 178 of them. That ratio is even wrong most of the time. If you look at the one, on the, I'll give you the one on the next page here, which is out here. This is probably makes more sense. If you can see the last three columns, this is, this is from 6.1 through 627. The last three columns. So we received in that time frame 239,000 emails, and we allowed 63,000 of them. We literally block 75% of all the mail that comes to us. There's that much crap coming our way on a monthly basis. It's insane. And this is why you do see things get through, right? We're spending a lot of our time, <laughs> we spend a lot of our time, so when these things don't catch it, we, you know, like you probably, you saw my email probably last week on the, on the Google Drive things, right? There's nothing wrong with that email other than the link is garbage, but everything in there looks right. So if you don't look at it, if you don't roll over the links, you're not gonna know, so. And again, this just comes back to, if you got a question, ask. We're more than happy to, you know, don't believe anything you get. I guess this is the, is the largest, best, best way to put it. Um, again, just overview. We touch everything. If it's electronic, for the most part, we touch it. If it's got, if it's got a camera, we touch it. If it's a computer, we touch it. Um, and we love it. So if you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer. Questions or comments for Mr. Collins? Uh, Alderman Clemens, then Alderman Bruno. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the uh, presentation. So first, wow, that's a lot of stuff for just a few people to manage, so that's, that's impressive. Uh, it sounds like you do focus a lot on security, and you have to. Um, thank you for mentioning the ransomware uh, headlines that we see all the time. I'm glad that you're mm -hmm. both aware of that and on top of it. Um, would you say, um, I know it's, it's a low chance that that'll happen to us, and it sounds like you've done everything you can within your power to. It, it can very easily happen. But it, and it sounds like it's most uh, people like us that will probably allow it to happen if it happens. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, the end user. But it, do we have a protocol or a policy in place? And I know that we have insurance sure. as well. But let's say that you come in or you get a call at four in the morning and it's like we're locked out or something. Yep. It's, something has happened. I'm not asking you to disclose what that policy may be. So I understand. You, but do we have one? Uh, we do. Okay. Uh, the very nature of our design of our, our backup networks somewhat, isol actually pretty robustly isolates this. So even if somebody came in and got, if somebody clicked a link and triggered something off like that, those networks can't see our backup networks. We physically air gap them. We, they are separate devices. So um, I'm not going to say it's 
but I'm going to say it's as close as we can get it. Okay. You know, and and that's just our stuff here. That's not even the ERP stuff, right? If we if we lost our mail server here, or if we lost some of our data files here, yeah, that's important. But nothing is as important as our ERP data, <laughs> anything to do with, with, <laughs> with our utility billing, with our employee data, that's really, that's the gold mine. And that's not on site, very specifically, again, designed that way, simply because the level of, the level of replication that I would like to have for that, we just can't afford to build that. And so it's easier for us to lease that from somebody else because they build it in scale, right? If you ever if you ever bored and you want to go down, you want to see a data center, I'll be happy to get you in at the county. You can see their data center. Their scale is nuts. So I'll take you up on that actually. Yeah, it's it's an interesting read. I just sure. I was just going to add too that Pete's been exceptionally vigilant over the past years as we start looking into the ERP system, as we start looking into the data that the city is responsible for. Pete has been very active and, and proactive in looking at what data is are what data is essential for us to have, what data do we need to keep, and if there's something that is redundant, if there's something that is unnecessary, are there ways that we can, you know, mass remove this from our system so that we are no longer responsible for it? Of course, working with any records retention requirements, we have to uh, work within those confines as well. Great, thank you. Yeah. We, we push very hard to, to alleviate our exposure. Same, it's kind of, if you think it's kind of the same way that we deal with our, uh, our payment system, right? Our credit card payment system. We don't want that data. We want to offload that to somebody else who's secured in doing that. We don't want to touch that stuff. We want to provide the service, obviously. Mm -hmm. But as far as the exposure, as much as we can minimize the exposure, we want to minimize the exposure. And we know that those vendors that we're using have been thoroughly vetted and that and, they're responsible. And they are responsible for that. I mean, you know, obviously we, obviously we would get sued too, right? But our exposure would be very minimal. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alderman Bruno. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thanks, Pete, for the uh, presentation. Uh, quick question. I can't remember where we stand on this. I think I saw it in budgeting. Do we, have we replaced the ticketing program that were uh, for the police the poli police program. I believe the police have already moved that they've already got they've got the uh, uh, the printers in the car so yeah I believe they've already got that in place that 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 yes that relic that they have I believe is on its way out the door okay. thanks it has served us well over 25 years <laughs> it predates me <laughs> anyone else in the day Pete, uh, approximately 40 years ago this month, I believe, or actually last month, which of course predates you, but perhaps has been the... the I cloth. wasn't even born then. <laughs> well, anyways, I'm, I'm challenging your memory here. What happened in the city of Geneva that has perhaps caused you not only a lot of work, but perhaps some angst, some uncertainty, some curiosities, some 40 years ago? So 79, what was 79? This, this, the city council entered into a first cable franchise with Centel. Uh, or was it Jones? Centel. Centel. You were here, right? You were an alderman. <laughs> <laughs> Not only had three channels at the time. <laughs> right. 40 years ago, man. Wow, that's right, I forgot about Business that. Isn't Centel, then Jones, then, yeah. <sighs> God, Ugh. isn't that wild? The bane of our existence. <laughs> yeah, good. Anyone else? Pete, keep up the good work, man. Please ask. You have questions, ask. Happy just to talk. Just don't email me anything, because I'll just call you. Right, right. I'm delete it. To just delete it. Now, um, yeah, for sure. Um, and, and again, seriously, if you'd, like to, if you'd like to go see some of this county stuff, if you're interested, if you have a dork need to go see, I will be happy to get us down there, because we're pretty tight with the county, and they're happy to show off what they've got. So cool. they have need toys, too. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Item four, folks, amendments to the agenda. Are there any amendments this evening? Item five is the omnibus agenda. All items marked with an asterisk are considered to be routine by this council. They can be considered and voted upon with one motion. Is there a motion? So motion by Alderman Marks. Second. Second by Alderman Swanson. Mr. Clerk, please take the roll. Burkhardt. Aye. Clements. Aye. Ruby. Aye. Haven. Aye. 
Kilberg. Aye. Maladra. Aye. Marks. Aye. McGowan. Aye. Swanson. Aye. Bruno. Aye. Item number five passes with 10 affirmative votes, zero nay votes, and zero absent. We skip down to item number 10, municipal bills for payment. We kindly ask our city clerk to read the bills in their aggregate for our consideration. Bills total $1,337,346.21. Mayor, I move that we approve and pay the bills as read. The individual items that add up to that amount can be found in tonight's packet on the city website. Alderman Bruno makes the motion to pay the bills as read, which are available in our packets and on the city's website. Is there a second? Seconded by Alderman Clemens. Any questions, any comments? Mr. Clerk. Clements. Aye. Ruby. Aye. Cabin. Aye. Kilbert. Aye. Maladra. Aye. Marks. Aye. McGowan. Aye. Swanson. Aye. Bruno. Aye. Burkhart. Aye. Item 10 passes with 10 affirmative votes, zero nay votes, and zero absent. We skip down to Committee of the Whole Items of Business. Item 11A is to consider resolution number 2019-62, authorizing execution of a master equity lease agreement in an amount not to exceed $825,000 and related addendums with Enterprise FM Trust, subject to final review by city attorney. Is there a motion? So moved. Motion by Alderman Marks. Second. Seconded by Alderman Bruno. This matter is on the floor, but prior to comments or questions from either our friends from Enterprise or the dais, I'd like to turn the microphones over to Ms. Dawkins for some brief remarks. I just wanted to pr provide a few extra remarks after last week. So this item was recommended for approval at the Committee of the Whole. Uh, since there, that time, we've provided additional information to the City Council and also posted that information on the City's website. Um, one of the things that was not mentioned is that while we listed the total expenditure anticipated in the summary, the anticipated revenue from the surplus vehicles was not. Uh, so we used a conservative estimate of $5,000 per vehicle, so the vehicles that we are trading in or surplusing. Uh, so if we were to get $5,000 per all of those vehicles, we would be looking at about $100,000. Uh, there's also, in the executive summary, there was an error in the chart that said uh, we were getting, uh, I think it says nine vehicles from the capital equipment fund, that should actually be 10. And then in the water fund, it says nine, it should actually be eight. The dollars don't change, just where the vehicles go changes. And then lastly, uh, we had some more discussions with Enterprise, and they have also agreed to reduce the basis points by 50. So therefore, when you're looking at the interest rate, the rate is fixed at time of delivery and based upon the three-year treasury, treasury bill, plus now it would be 250 basis points. Uh, interest also went down a little bit, so this month, in that example, it would be 4.21%, whereas last week it was 4.79%. Uh, so with that, um, I would also note that because this is a lease agreement, it does require a two-thirds vote, including the mayor, which would be eight affirmative votes to pass. And then I do have Gabby Harding and Sam Denton present this evening if there's additional questions for Enterprise directly. Otherwise, I'm available to answer questions uh, from the city's perspective. Thank you. Questions or comments from the dais? <clears throat> Alderman Clements. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Okay, so everyone bear with me, please. Um, so last we discussed this, um, I came into that meeting in favor of this measure, um, and then Alderman Swanson raised some uh, valid points and concerns, which gave me pause, uh, and I wanted to think about this more. Um, I have, sorry, Bob, since swung back into favor of this, uh, of this idea. Um, and I have a few reasons for that. Um, and I'll start, I guess, by just addressing, I think, what I, I thought were the primary concerns, at least for me. Uh, one was the scale of this uh, idea. Uh, we have to, I'm looking at this kind of like it's a pilot program. And so scale was important. I think 20 looked large. Um, especially where you looked at where we were starting with how many vehicles we were going to do. But, uh, you know, I, I inquired about the fleet size, and I like to look at things on a relative basis. And for this one, it's, it's less than a fifth of the fleet, so that's 17%. Um, and, you know, if we're going to do a pilot program and try something new out, that seems like a good number to me, because if we go too small, we won't actually be able to measure whether or not it was a success or a failure. Um, and if we go too big, if we're wrong, 
you know, it could kind of blow up on us. So I think it's big enough that it gives us meaningful feedback for the pilot, um, but it's small enough that if, if we're wrong, it's not the end of the world. Um, the second issue, and perhaps the bigger one, is the fact that, yes, this is a lease and there are finance charges. So where does that work? How does that work? Where does it come from? So as I thought about this, I was looking at this kind of as a, a retail consumer, buyer lease. You know, as a retail consumer, though, like if I think about this, I, you're not going to buy a, a F-350 or a vehicle for 50000 bucks, take it down to zero residual, and then pump thousands and thousands of dollars into maintenance. We do. Um, and so that's expensive. I think that part of this finance charge would be absorbed by that, if not overcome by that. Uh, the second leg of this thing, and the enterprise's business model, I believe, is that they understand the secondary market very well, arguably, no offense to our staff, better than they do. Uh, so, you know, they're going to say this is a time on the curve when you should get rid of this vehicle because you're going to maximize your equity on the res residual value. Will they be wrong? Yes, absolutely. We will lose on some of these. The question boils down to the expectation here, the probability and the magnitude of the equity on the residual. I believe based on the evidence we saw from the um, turnover in Chicago with their most recent uh, vehicles that they flipped, they were well ahead on that, both in the probability of it being positive and on the magnitude. So the expectation looks like it's there. Again, it might not be, but that's why this, the scale of this pilot program needs to be right. Um, so. I think that we have the opportunity to potentially provide a modern fleet, uh, help us you know, achieve the goals that we have set in our, our own plan of providing those excellent municipal services uh, for the same amount of money or less than we could do otherwise. Uh, so I think it's actually an opportunity to, to try something kind of neat. Um, my, my concerns have been allayed. Um, so that's that's my two cents. And I should we have a, I, Alderman Kilberg. You had said that your firm has worked with Enterprise Fleet, and you were saying that they thought it was a good um, a good deal, and that there were, not a good deal, but that they were uh, it was good, well received. Is that correct? So yeah, I'm comfortable. I think trying it and putting a foot in the water. Not a, I know it's not a tow because it's 20 vehicles, but a foot. So that's that's my 20 cents. Thank you. Anyone else on the dais? Alderman Swanson. Uh, thank you. Um, Alderman Clements, you were, you were absolutely correct that uh, I, I opposed this deal. And, and, and I'm sorry to hear that you did flip. But uh, my, my fears have not been allayed by the information that has been provided. Uh, you mentioned a couple things. The, the scale is a problem for me. We're, we're going to a nearly a million dollar uh, proposal, uh, which has finance charges. And that is a new cost for us. We have not been financing our vehicle purchases. So now we are going to be paying 4.2% more for our vehicles. One of the benefits that this program has been touting is that we will get money back if the value exceeds the uh, book value at the end of the lease. However, no one mentions that the flip side is true. And if that value is less than, we will pay that amount to enterprise. We would not be doing that if we own the vehicles. Yes, the value would be less, but we would not owe any additional amount to someone else. It takes away flexibility in that we will have to renew these leases or uh, terminate them at the end of the lease term, whereas before, when we owned the vehicles, we could extend replacing them, particularly in an economic downturn. And I'm still very concerned about an economic downturn because the one item that triggers us owing more money is the residual value. And if we have an economic downturn and all municipalities are no longer purchasing things, residual values are going to drop. And everyone will be in that boat. We're going to owe enterprise money and lose the flexibility that we used before to weather the downturn. So I'm still very concerned about that. And finally, the data that Chicago provided or was provided regarding Chicago was a very small data set for a very small period. And I don't know if it was cherry picked or not, to me, a valid data set would be over a course of many years. It would be all of their leases, not just a, a selection. And then we could see what were the amount of gains on this vehicle or losses on this by year. We only have a one year period. We don't know what the residual values are going to do. So my fears have not been allayed and I, I continue to oppose the project. So thank you.
Thank you. Anyone else on the dais? Alderman Caven. Thank you. Um, I definitely had some of the same some of the same concerns that Alderman Swanson just detailed and some of the original ones that um, Alderman Clements did as well. The overall size, what happens if we do have an economic downturn, the added interest rates that we're not currently paying. That being said, I do understand that there's a certain amount of this fleet that, that does need to be turned over. And this gives us the opportunity to have a more immediate impact on that. Um, you know, I know a lot of people said size and scope. I think that I could get behind something like this, but the way that I would like to see that done, and I don't know if this is exactly correct, but I would look for less vehicles to be leased and then also purchase some vehicles this year so you could sort of line them up a little bit and see how that looks over the course of one, two, three years so we could have not just you know, the data set from Enterprise, but taking a look at a smaller sample. And I agree with you, Mike. I mean, 20% for a, for a pilot is not, I don't think that's outlandish for a lot of different pilots that I've worked on and seen, but in this specific case, with the total amount of expenditure, something like that where we maybe didn't wind up being able to change over 20 vehicles this year, maybe you were able to sign the lease for 10, and maybe you still purchased three based off of where the rough numbers are. I think for me that would be something that would be more palatable because I do think that it's worth giving it a try, but I, I definitely have some of those um, reservations and concerns as well. So. Anyone else who has not yet spoken wish to speak or ask a question, provide a comment regarding this matter? Otherwise, I'll recognize Alderman Clements for a second time. Alderman Clements. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, not to belabor any of these points. So, uh, Alderman Swanson, I do realize that it, the flip side of this is that we owe a check. I'm not, not avoiding that topic at all. And that's why I was talking about the expectation. I, I, I fully expect that there will be losers in the basket, but I believe that the majority, based on the just granted the data that I've seen, would indicate that there is a positive expectation for the city here. As far as cherry pick data, that's a legitimate concern. Um, I think I, I can't discuss anything about that data. Perhaps uh, the enterprise people could or the city could tell us something more about it, uh, the, the criteria, the whatever. I mean, I, I don't think it was probably cherry pick because that would imply that it was biased for our viewing, and I, I suspect that's not the case. Um, so can you tell us? Well, any? they picked the last the vehicle sold in the last 12 months for the city of Chicago that had a resi residual value of greater than 2000. So that's what we provided. We didn't go back. I mean, if Sam wants to come up and speak to that, yeah, certainly. Thank you, Stephanie, members of the council. My name is Sam Ditton. I'm the sales manager uh, for Enterprise Fleet Management in Chicago. On the data set specifically, uh, yeah, I went back and looked at the last 12 months of resale data for the city of Chicago, and I believe there were 25 vehicles that had a book value of $2,000 or greater. There were a number of vehicles we've disposed of over the last 12 months that were fully depreciated. They, there was no ending balance so everything that we'd sold those vehicles for was equity. I didn't think that was a valuable to or value of, of, to, to you all. So the goal, goal there was to show you here's the lease term, here's the ending book value at the end of that lease term, here's what we sold it for, and here's the equity that we turned back to the city and I believe the amount was about $165,000. The lease itself, um, I, I don't want to give the impression that it's not a flexible lease because that is actually the benefit of the open end lease with Enterprise. If you get to the end of a lease term and there is that ending book value and your account management team as we sit down 12 months prior to that lease being up for, for term, you're going to know exactly where you are within that lease today and where you're going to be in, in 12 months. So if the market does tank and it doesn't make sense for us to sell that vehicle on your behalf, then you just extend the lease out and continue to pay it down. Um, I didn't want to give the impression that at the end of five years, Enterprise is going to sell it no matter what, and you're upside down, you're upside down. That's not how we operate as a business. It truly is a business partnership where we look at these depreciating assets um, with you at least twice a year. Um, we're going to do a fleet plan 12 months prior to that lease coming to term, and you're going to know exactly where you are in that vehicle at that point and where you're going to be 12 months from now. 
Um, for us, it's all about managing total cost of ownership, and a big part of that is how these vehicles depreciate. Good. Okay. Alderman Clements, you still have the floor. Anything else? Uh, no, Mayor, I'm done. Thank you. Before I recognize Alderman Swanson for a second time, anyone else who has not yet spoken wish to do so? Alderman Maladra, then Alderman Swanson. Microphone, Craig. Turn it off. <laughs> do you have similar uh, programs with other cities? Um, we do, yeah. In fact, um, the government space is probably our fastest growing segment of our business. We have 15 customers that we've brought on board in the greater Chicagoland area this fiscal year alone, so over the last 11 months. Uh, nationally, we have close to 1,000 government customers and over 30,000 vehicles on lease. Um, our customer base here in the Chicagoland area, outside of the city of Chicago and the Chicago Transit Authority, it's the village around Lake Beach, the city of Freeport. Um, Oak Brook. Yeah, Village of Oak Brook, uh, Bourbon A, Madsen, the city of Kankakee. Okay. So yeah. and, and the programs are structured similarly. Correct. The longest one that you've had is how long? The longest partnership we've had is the city of Chicago. And that's been for how long? Uh, it's, we're going on probably the 15th year of that partnership. Years. And in the 15 years, um, you've seen market up ticks and market down ticks and things like that. For sure. And the impact has been, I mean, they continue to re-up with you guys, so I don't know that it's been that significant. Correct, yeah. yeah. It's been a good partnership. Thanks. Alderman Swanson. Uh, the data with Chicago, uh, I'm assuming then there are, there are situations where vehicles, the Chicago has to cut you a check if the residual value is less than the book value. I, I'm not going to say that that never happens. I can't think of, a, if I look back at the data over the last 12 months, um, that had it happened based on that data subset. The only way that should, should ever happen is if you turn a vehicle in and it's you know, missing a tailgate and, and two doors, right? Or if we didn't appreciate the vehicle the right way. Um, when we set these vehicles up on a lease term, it's based on vehicle type um, and how many miles you think we're going to drive that vehicle per year so we can depreciate the vehicle the right way. If for whatever reason, if we're not doing our job the right way and we set a vehicle up on a 48 month term because you're gonna drive 10,000 miles a year, we're gonna depreciate it at a certain rate to give you that reduced book value. If all of a sudden you're driving that vehicle 25,000 miles a year, right, and we don't adjust the depreciation, make sure you're paying the vehicle down accordingly, yeah, of course you're gonna be upside down because we didn't appreciate the vehicle the right way. We didn't do our job the right way. Um, there were three instances that um, we, we, we discussed where there was a total loss on a vehicle, so the data looked a little um, goofy. That's not managed depreciation. Um, but again, this is a business partnership. If we're doing our job the right way, um, you should not be in a negative equity position at the end of a lease term. I, it's I not guess a sustainable I, business model for us. I would take exception, though, to the paragraph 3C in the agreement that has, says nothing about how we're using it or how many miles it is or how the debris, it, it all is based on the book value and the residual value at the end of the lease. Yeah, that's just for lease qualification for an operating lease. Um, each individual vehicle that you lease from us is tied to a specific quote, which specifically states the uh, depreciation rate, the ending book value, and how many miles we anticipate you're gonna drive per year. And there's no over mileage penalties. We just want to make an assumption on, I mean, we have some pretty good data as to how many miles you're gonna drive per year, because for us, annual mileage is all about depreciating the vehicle. Okay, and, and I'm not gonna get into the mileage, I'm just saying paragraph 3C, as amended, is pretty, ob it, it's very specific and states that we will cut you a check for the difference in value if need be, if as it exists at the close, which, which, which bothers me because those are items that we cannot control. Now, the, the second point I wanted to bring up is you mentioned uh, the city of Chicago was mm -hmm. receiving 160,000 or something on the 25 vehicles. Yeah, whatever the number is. However, <laughs> that number would be reduced by the amount of interest uh, certainly in the case of Geneva, which currently is not financing those vehicles. So we would be paying interest year after year after year on these leases. So irrespective of how much we're going to get at the end of the lease, we're paying, uh, we're paying more for those vehicles. So it's one thing to say we, Chicago got this wonderful pot of gold at the end of the leases, but however, there's a cost involved and, and I want everyone to be aware of that. So thank you. Thank you. Alderman Ruby. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm having a hard time with the Chicago-Geneva comparison, just based on scale. Um, it, 
I question the relevance of, of even comparing the two towns. Sure. Um, a uh, bigger question I have is um, related to the interest. So 4.21 is the interest rate? Correct. Um, so, and that's le least, you're the bank, you're the lender. Okay, do you accept cash or do we have to go through your financing program? Yeah, we accept cash. Okay, I don't know if that's an option for the city, but I was just yeah. curious about that. And again, the, the benefit of the, the funding structure, and I'm not selling lease versus paying cash at all, it's helping the city acquire more vehicles for less total cash. Um, I believe our, our total, some of our total lease payments, I don't have the number in front of me, I think it's close to $170,000. Uh, historically, what you do today is go out with cash and buy roughly four, four and a half vehicles each year with cash. For about $105,000 was, was, was the number. What we're recommending today is you spend about $90,000 more per year versus what you typically do, and you get seven times the vehicles and the thought is if we can drive down the average age of your fleet and implement a more sustainable replacement plan today through this funding model um, we're going to drive down your your operational cost maintenance and fuel specifically um, why chicago is relevant and I, I get the city it's, it's a big city is that it doesn't matter if you have you know three million people in, in your city or if you have thirty thousand you get the same incentives as chicago Done. So whether it's, it's Chicago or um, the village of Round Lake Beach is another long-term customer of ours who I know will say great things about us and our ability to sell their vehicles at the right time for the right amount of money. You know, for us, a vehicle is a vehicle. It doesn't matter how big the community is that, um, that, that we partner with, if that makes sense. Sure. Well, just the, just the issue of volume and you know, the, the higher volume, the better your odds of having a good return could be. Yeah, and we, we're a business that sells over a million vehicles a year, so I, I get okay. that. Thank you. Anyone else who has not yet spoken wish to do so? <clears throat> Alderman Clements. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so as far as the, I think it's a valid point to ask comparing Chicago to Geneva, I get that. Um, but I think the way I look at this, it. If they have an F-350 and we have an F-350, that, that's the car is the same car whether or not Chicago is driving it or we're driving it. Now, they're already saying as a business model, they're giving us the same incentives as Chicago. So if we have a white F-350, they have a white F-350, the residual value is no different. It's the same. Just because it's in Chicago versus Geneva. So it's the same. Um, it's, it's vehicle based. It's not based on the volume of how many 350s they have. It's the residual value on the vehicle. Um, and again, the, the finance charges, the big, a big component of this comes out of the maintenance costs. We're not going to be beating the vehicles to a pulp and keeping them operational by pumping thousands of dollars into a dead car that we're never going to get anything but scrap out of. So I, I and no, we, we very well, I expect if we were to do this full throttle, down the line, we will absolutely cut a check or give you cash or whatever because you're going to be wrong at some point. That happens. But the key is, again, the expectation here is that the majority of the time, that will not be the case. And that, so the magnitude of that equity combined with the probability of you being correct will far outweigh the times that we do cut those checks. Combined with the maintenance costs, this seems reasonable and it lets us modernize our fleet quicker and, and provide our employees and our municipality with better stuff. So I just, I think it makes sense to try this. I think that 20 is a good number. Again, it's big enough, we're gonna get real feedback because we'll see, if it's not working, we'll see it there. Um, and it's small enough that we're, we're not gonna be doing irreparable harm. Uh, so I, I think, I just think this makes sense to, to try. Anyone else wish to speak before I recognize Alderman Maladra for a second time? Alderman Maladra. So I've, I've never exactly been a, a big fan of leasing. Um, I think we don't we don't lease our personal cars. Sure. Um, I like the idea of ownership, but at the same time, I'm aware that businesses lease more often than they buy. Um, leasing always comes with a finance charge. I don't know anybody who's going to give us a lease with a zero percent financing so there there must be a reason why companies like Dean's or companies like mine uh, companies like my dad's uh, lease pools and I think that Mike was uh, heading in, the, in exactly that direction it keeps the age of the pool to a reasonable level 
where you offset the maintenance cost if it gets any older with you keeping the pool younger, uh, more modern, modernized. Um, I think Stephanie touched on the fuel uh, economy aspect last time as well. You know, year over year, uh, technology improves and the fleet gets more efficient. Um, so basically, the ability for us to be able to bring down the age of our fleet, uh, to introduce to the fleet more modern, uh, newer, more safe uh, equipment in a 20% chunk, there's no other way we're going to be able to do it. Add to that that I've been hearing for about 10 years that we're fools not to be leasing. I like the idea of getting some data that we can use to put the question to rest one way or the other. So I think that we do it. Anyone else wish to speak? Otherwise, we will take the vote. Alderman Caven? Sorry. No, oh, all good. Well, you were all ready to take a breath right there, so <laughs> I got it just in the nick of time. Um, no, I, I definitely think this is something that we should try as well. I would just be a lot more comfortable with 10% of the vehicles being leased to start off with rather than the 20 and still being able to purchase some because I look at this, okay, so we do 20 this year. If maybe the other way we were able to do 13, but so then what happens next year? So next year we're having the same discussion and you know, there's a certain amount of the fleet that needs to go out. So we lease 20 cars this year. So does that mean we don't do any next year? So from, so if I could, so from, yeah. Absolutely. So from a, a business model, um, so six months prior um, to I guess so we're, we're 12 months into our partnership right so six months prior to when you all start to look at your budget for next budget year your account manager is going to come down and sit down with you and make some replacement recommendations based on um, current equity in your existing fleet today how those vehicles are appreciating what they're worth today what they're worth in 12 months what your operational cost looks like today what will be be over the next 12 months and we're going to make some replacement recommendations based on the data that we have um, and then we're going to align those replacement recommendation, recommendations with your your budget. Um, if it makes sense to replace more vehicles, it's your decision to make. Our job is to give you, I think, a little bit more and some better data to make better informed decisions. If the answer is we're going to replace 20, great. If it's, if it's zero, that's okay too. Um, what we want to do is, is be a fleet partner, a, a consultant to help you make maybe a little more informed decisions as to w what you should replace and, and the math that drives why you should replace it. No, and that makes, that makes complete sense, and thank you very much um, for that explanation, but we decided to lease 20 of them today. Six months from now, we're already reevaluating, so the recommendation might come back to then lease another 10 or another mini pass set. So when you're talking about looking at a sample size, that sample size of 20, 10 months from now might wind up being a sample size of larger. And I'm not, I would really like to try this. I, I, I really want to, I really want to give this an opportunity because I know that a lot of this fleet needs to be replaced. It makes me nervous to start out with 20% of it today, mm -hmm. knowing that 10 months from now, it may wind up being more than what 20% is if we're having the same discussion again. If I may, because we're talking about the fleet as a whole fleet, it's, it's not a whole fleet when it's not. So you have three funds. You have the capital equipment fund, you have the water fund, and you have the electric fund. So we're looking at 20% of all vehicles over all three funds. We're looking at 13% of capital equipment fund vehicles. Um, I didn't do the math on the other two because typically capital equipment is the one general fund that you're most usually concerned with. So if we're looking at um, electric, we're looking at two vehicles out of 17 vehicles. So that is 11%. And in the water, wastewater, you're looking at eight vehicles out of 18. So you're looking water 44%. So, so again, if you're looking at a whole fleet, yes, it's 20%. If you look at it by fund, by fund, by fund, which is what we need to do, then you're not. So I just want to make sure that you understand. So if you say you want to do 10 lease vehicles, then I need to know, are those 10 lease vehicles, 10 lease over three funds, 10 lease only out of the capital fund, which Right now, we're only doing 10 out of the capital equipment fund or, or how that, that works. Because we went through this. We went through the fleet. We sat down with all the department managers. We sat down with our fleet manager. We sat down with Enterprise. Um, of the cars we were looking at replacing, 
15 of those vehicles are older than 2012. Nine of that 15 are older than 2007. So again, it's about modernizing the fleet and trying to do that. But I, but I hesitate that when we, we talk about it as a whole, but it's really, you've got to look at it as, as three separate parts. Alderman Cava still has the floor. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, without objection, we will take a vote. Mr. Clerk, Alderman Burkert. No, oh. vote. I'm ready for vote. Mr. Clerk, vote. please take the roll. Ruby. Nay. Caven. Nay. Kilberg. Yes. Is it aye. Aye. Maladra. Aye. Marks. Aye. McGowan. Aye. Swanson. Nay. Bruno. Aye. Burkhardt. Aye. Clements. Aye. And uh, the mayor votes aye. That's eight affirmative, three opposed. The matter has been passed. Thank you all very much. We appreciate it. Item 12, ladies and gentlemen, new business. Uh, we will defer to our friends in the audience who have joined us this evening to share any questions or comments with us regarding new business about anything, any topic. Mr. Sharp? I'll go. All yours, sir. Good evening, everybody. My name is Gary Sharp, and I want to go over and talk about the residential parking uh, ordinance, which I believe, if I got the year right, we started talking about this in 2012, and it was accepted into an ordinance in 2013. The residential parking, I give you a brief, uh, you know, uh, reason why this issue has come up, was because of the high school area. Now, I live on the corner of Ford and Grant Street, which is one block west of the high school. And at that time, before the ordinance was passed, was that uh, we were having high school kids parking on the residential streets, and fire trucks, ambulances, even police cars, my vehicle, we were having trouble getting up and down the streets. So... I was involved with this when we were talking about it back in 2012 and we came up with this residential parking where you needed a, a sticker uh, to put in your vehicle if you want to park on the street during school days. Well, it has evolved now to where uh, right now is my understanding of the ordinance is it goes from uh, to the north on Gray Street all the way south to Route 38 and then it goes from the east would be Illinois Avenue which I'm not positive on that one but it's someplace around Burgess Norton and then to the west it'd be Willow Lane. Um, I'm still seeing cars, ki high school kids parking vehicles on all these side streets. Uh, the biggest concern that I'm having with this, especially is on Logan Avenue. Logan Avenue, it says in the ordinance, which I bought this monstrosity of a whole bunch, is there 23 pages front and back of the ordinances of all the different parking reg regulations in Geneva. And um, what I'm most concerned about is I'm an employee of the Geneva School District 304. I work second shift as a, I, would like, I like to call it a custodial technician. I'm a janitor, in other words. And we are told that we have to park our vehicles on, on uh, somewhere on Logan Avenue because that's where our time clock is. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we go in door uh, 15W, which is on the west side of the high school. Our time clock is there right at that door. 
people have asked, and I have talked to Mayor Burns about this, and people say, well, why don't you folks park in the McKinley Street parking lot? The problem with that is that uh, it's on the east side of the building, for one thing. We have individuals, we have custodians on second shift that have also day jobs, and they get there right at 3.30. They get in, they punch the clock so they're not tardy. Um, also then for lunch, a lot of people go out for lunch uh, at 7.30 to 8 o'clock. Well, by the time you would walk, you know, from the west side of the building where the time clock is to the east side, go out for lunch and then come back, you don't have a lot of time left. Now, what I... I uh, have noticed that, and what I can recall, what Mayor Burns can recall too, which I've had a few conversations with him on this, and I have even randomly talked to four police officers uh, here in Geneva. I don't know their names. I just happened to run into them in 7-Eleven or someplace, and, and I asked them about the ordinance. And the ordinance states right now is that uh, there is no parking on, on all these streets from 6 a.m. in the morning until 4 p.m. in the afternoon. We start our shift at the high school at 3.30. You can park on Logan Avenue on the east side of Logan Avenue from Center Street all the way to Ford Street, okay? Um, I've, the police officers I've talked to, two of them said is that they thought the ordinance read was that no parking from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. on school days only. The, and that's what Mayor Burns had thought that's what it was too. That's what I remember them saying. I even remember them putting a sign in my yard and up and down 4th Street that said no parking 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. on school days only. Then about three, four years ago, they came by and put all new signs up that said no parking 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday. Nothing about the, uh, you know, on school days only. There is an individual, which I'm not going to get into too much details with this person, but right across the street on the, on the Mac Olson side, which is on the, again, the west side of the building, there's an individual who has a motor home. And that individual is constantly, constantly calling the police because they're, either their three cars can't park right in front of the house, which I don't see any of the stickers in their, in, in their windows, but the motorhome is, is in the driveway. Or the motorhome, they park it on the street during school days. Now, with that being said, I... One day here, the, about, about, it was about a month or so ago, the police officer who patrols all the neighborhood streets and all the parking here in Geneva, I stopped him, or you know, he was writing tickets out on Logan Avenue, and all the vehicles, again, between Center Street and Ford Street, that was it. There was cars parked on Logan, Street or Logan Avenue, I guess it is, uh, north of Center Street. And it was on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. It was during the week. And I said to him, I, I, I says, well, what about those vehicles over here parked up on Logan? And he said that he's not going to worry about them because there hasn't been any complaints. The complaints have all been between Again, Center Street and Ford Street. And we at the high school, 
you know, the kids, I see kids every day during the school because I go down to 7-Eleven each, each morning and I get my Long John Donut for my breakfast and, and my Daily Herald newspaper. Every day I get it. It costs me $3.02. And I come back and I look at kids parking on Anderson Boulevard. In, uh, parking on, you know, Richard Street. Park, they park everywhere. And I don't, I don't believe, of course, I've got no way of knowing, but I, I don't believe these, these people are getting ticketed. Now, if the ordinance says, and it does say that no parking from 6 to 4 p.m., you know, Monday through Friday, why aren't these vehicles being ticketed? They're just being ticketed between Center Street and Fort Street on the west side. I don't, I don't like it. I don't agree with it. I've talked to Mayor Burns, what, the last year we've had three or four conversations on this at different venues. And I would like to see the ordinance changed to 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. So we have a place to park. People might ask, you know, about, you know, why don't we put a time clock on the east side of the school? Well, there's the, all, all the doors on the east side of the school, the kids would have access to that, to that time clock. There's no, there's no room or there's no private entrance is that we could come in and and punch our clock in so my my you know great you know gripe with this would be if you're gonna if you're gonna ticket the people between center and ford fine then you gotta ticket everybody not just pick out that particular area Mr. Sharp, this is why I walk to all the games. But thank you. You and I have had this discussion for some time. And I'm delighted that you're here tonight. So thank well, you very, I very much. I finally, after, after I talked with the police officer who monitors the parking, right. and, you know, he's, you know, I said, what about those vehicles parked on Logan north of Center Street? And he said he's not going to ticket them because it, 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 they've had no complaints. And as I said, you know, he was the fourth police officer I've talked to. Uh, over the last probably seven, eight months, I've talked to three other police officers, mainly at basketball games and stuff because I'm at the high school all the time. And, you know, a couple of them also said that they thought the ordinance said and that it was agreed upon back in, and I said, I, I believe I have the year right, it was 2013, um, was that it's supposed to be on school days only. And the originals, the, all the no parking signs went up that way. And then a few years ago, they were all taken down and new ones put up. If you'll permit me to uh, direct our city administrator, Stephanie Dawkins, to meet with the chief and his commanders, and we will A, clarify the ordinance language, and B, I will provide you either via phone call, you and I have our cell phone numbers, each other's right. cell phone numbers, and we'll get to the bottom of it. That's all Thank good. you. You're welcome. Thank I'll, you. I'll for come by your house and I'll park in your driveway, not in the street, but I'll come by your house and we can discuss it. It just don't, don't hit my husky. I promise I won't. <laughs> if she just turned 15. Dear Lord. So. <laughs> Happy okay. birthday to her. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Anyone else? Anyone from the dais? Oh, Alderman Kilberg. Yeah. Well, uh, we look into why the, the sign has changed. So in essence, I guess the question is, is how is it treated in the summer months? Well, the, in other summer, words, are you in violation if you're parking there in the summer months as well? Yes. Yeah, that's part of the conversation we'll have with the chief as well. And, and Mr. Sharper and I've had this conversation too. Because uh, I do recall, and I know Alderman Kilberg and others recall the conversations we've had with Geneva High School faculty, staff, and students for, oh my God, 
years, decades even. And I mean, it, you know, there were some streets, you know, I know Grant, no. if you want me to come back up there. Oh, that's, that, yeah, if you, if you, only if you're comfortable doing so. Thank you. Um, I, know, I know a couple of other streets back in, you know, 2010 and 2011, like Grant Street, for example, or Grant Avenue. Down at the north end of Grant Avenue, I mean, it was, you could not get a fire truck. You could not get an ambulance through there. Okay, which is, I mean, I live on that street. If I have a medical issue or my house is on fire, I kind of want, you know, access to, for them to come down. I agree with the ordinance, okay? I just don't agree with the times and the fact is that they only ticket people in a certain area. Or that's my opinion at least. Okay? Because I mean I watched that I watched that officer and he told me was that he's not gonna worry about the uh, is about the cars parked north of Center Street on Logan, which it was during the week. You know, he should have been ticketing those cars too. He wrote out four or five tickets that same day from Ford to uh, uh, Center Street to Ford Street. Steph and I will meet with the chief, and then we will apprise both Alderman Burghardt and Alderman Bruno of the results, and of course we'll share it with the council as well, and then we can have a nice conversation. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Anyone else on the dais? Anything? A motion to adjourn would be in order of this city council meeting. So, so motion by Alderman Marks. All in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? We are adjourned. But not for long, folks. I I Ladies and gentlemen, we'll jump into the committee of the whole meeting without objection. I kindly ask our city clerk. Actually, you know what? Forget it, Mr. Clerk. We're going to, who needs a roll, right? Let's just let the record show that all the aldermen and soon-to-be Gene will be present. None of them left. None of them left. <laughs> <laughs> Item two is to approve the special committee of the whole minutes from June 10, 2019, and regular committee of the whole minutes from June 17, 2019. So is there moved. a motion? Oh, motion by Bruno, seconded by Swanson. Questions or comments? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Item 3A, folks, is to consider approval of draft resolution number 2019-66, authorizing execution of a memorandum of agreement between Ashland Ventures, LLC, and the City of Geneva. So, Motion by Burghardt. Second. Seconded by Ruby. Ms. Dawkins, preamble. Um, so actually, I'm going to give you kind of a preamble to both item A and item B. They're, they're interrelated. Okay. So the first item... Um, is a memorandum of agreement between Ashland Ventures LLC and the City of Geneva to make improvements in the right of ways along the parking lot at 25 North 3rd Street at the southwest corner of North 3rd Street and Hamilton Street. Uh, the second item is a resolution to release an ingress egress easement situated on a part of the real property known as 25 North 3rd Street. Um, so we're going to have a short presentation. I've invited um, Paul Kowalik, who's the chairman of Ashland Ventures, to give a brief overview of the project. But essentially, um, it's a, we've done previous public-private par partnerships with Ashland Ventures. This is a continuation of that. The easement vacation is just ingress, egress. It's been vetted through staff as far as whether we need that for our public, pro our public parking lot. And we're, we're good with releasing that. Um, and we're excited about what we have planned. So Paul, if you want to take a... Take a stand and tell us what you got. Well, thank you very much. The last time I was in the chamber, I was uh, accepting an award for right. historic preservation for Ashland Center. And uh, we haven't stopped. And what I'm going to do today is get to the matter at hand by way of providing some context. Because what Ashland Center at 25 North 3rd Street really is, is we consider it to be a gateway to the historic district. We're at the very north end of the district. And therefore, it is an important building. I'm going to say why and how long it's been an important building and how we are going to contribute to the community and to life and kind of changing and more of an engaged involvement with pedestrians and bringing more life to the north end of that district. Even though we're not a business, we're just a property. 
So the first thing I'd like to do is give you a little bit of background with respect to uh, the acquisition of the properties made in 2014. And we have really had a five-year plan, and we're coming back to it to the finish it. The main building, located at 25 North 3rd Street, has always been an economic engine for the block. It began as a national tea grocery store in 1954, celebrating its 65th birthday this year. It moved a little bit away from there, and then the property was purchased and redeveloped as the first National Bank of Geneva in 1967. And obviously one of the things you're going to notice is the evolution of four teller drive-through lanes in addition to two original teller windows, which in 1969 was incredibly innovative. You'll also see that the municipal lot behind the building didn't exist. So when we bought the building, we uh, recognized that the building was a very large element in an asphalt sea. Everything was about the cars. The design of the grocery store, the supermarket, innovative, bringing cars. The bank with more and more drive-through lanes, people not walking to the bank, driving to the bank. When we refinished and re-executed against the plan to develop the property in 2014, we changed the facade by introducing these long boards, which actually looked more contemporary to the period of which the building was. Once we took care of that, we decided to focus on the outside and introduce the notion of a park-like setting for this building in this asphalt seat. We replaced the drive-through with private parking. We introduced a patio arbor for our tenants and the public. And this is what the building looked like last summer. You can see the tenant, you can see the arbor, you can see the green space. You can also see to the left of it permeable pavers acting as a pedway. This is a view before the pedway was put in, and one of the things you'll notice that gets to the point about the easement is that hoisted by our own petard, by eliminating the, the drive-through lanes, we created a street. You can now see directly all the way to Second Street. The patio itself, used for the tenants as an amenity, is also open to the public, and as of course we used uh, pavers everywhere, and in fact we incorporated Geneva brick, just to be a little more consistent. Once we finished the east, uh, lot, we wanted to address the east side of the building, which abuts in the municipal parking lot directly. There is no uh, setback. And to do that, we needed a public-private partnership, and it was a perfect time because the lot was being refinished in 2017. This is the beautiful appearance of the lot in 2017. Take note of the dumpster next to the building, the bollards, the uh, cracked pavement. So what I proposed and what we worked out with with the city and many departments was we put continuous uh, curbing for planting, running the length of the building, as well as an 8 by 24 foot grace area to come in out of pavers. They're planted and maintained and funded by Ashland, Ashland Ventures, and they have really added to the development of the property, as well as facilitating the way the municipal lot was redeveloped because we introduced more green space to allow for the restriping of the lot according to IDOT standards. So putting it all together, well, we ran out of time, so we had to wait until the next spring, and we capped it all off by introducing this beautiful awning canopy. So here, if there was ever a good example of a very straightforward, simple, but a very effective public-private partnership. So we didn't stop there, because we had another side of the building we had to uh, work on. So in summary, we created a handsome Ashland Center entrance, we added sustainable green space, we incorporated friendly paver services for water runoff and filtration, and we enabled additional parking in the municipal lot while expanding the appearance of a park environment now to two sides. We have another parking lot that we own on the west side. This one is interesting. interesting. The bank knocked down a house, built their parking lot right up to the sidewalk, we corrected the encroachment on city property, improved the lot, added signage, but still it's all about the cars. And these photographs that I've been showing you that are historical are courtesy of the Geneva History Museum's docents and researchers who we use a lot. This building was knocked down, and here is the new parking lot. Notice the cars on the right-hand side parked directly up to the sidewalk. That's great, except eight feet of that doesn't belong to the property owner. <laughs> so when we bought the building, we had to correct this, and the easiest thing to do is just going back to the lot line you will see this is what the lot looked like in 2015 when we just finished paving it. And you'll notice that strip of dirt over to the right that we filled with, uh, filled with nice clean fill and uh, put some uh, 
finish on it, and that was it. Well, that gives us an opportunity for trans uh, transformation and another way to continue our public-private partnerships and extend the park-like setting for this boundary, the historic district, and the community. And as I said, think of this now as a gateway to the historic district. This is what the place, the space looks like. It's eight feet by 140 feet, and this is what it looked like at the beginning of, the, of this winter. So inherent in every problem is its own solution. And my solution and the team at Ashland Ventures was make a European style park. And this is the one of the, I'm going to take you through four renderings of this park. It has trees, it has sustainable landscaping. The city will provide the irrigation as part of their extension from the knuckles near it. It only needs irrigation for a short period of time because of the plants that we're putting in just to get them started. It has two benches, it has six bike racks, and it has a litter bin. So this is not just a garden. This is a place for people to walk, congregate, rest, and get into the community. There are these various elevations show you low views, high views. This, this is obviously looking east. And this uh, plan has been talked about with members of the community who are neighbors on Hamilton Street. I've met with individual uh, aldermen to get their feedback on this. And from that, we came up with these executions and are now ready to move forward. And this plan can be executed in full, we think, by Labor Day. So sustainable green space as a gateway to the district, vital and attractive spaces, encouraging walkers and community life, and again, demonstrating the effectiveness of public-private partnerships in the city of Geneva. So let's make it look a little, little more high tech. So here is a fly through of what I just showed you on the four slides. You'll notice the benches as we go past them. You'll notice the green space. Uh, one of the things we're looking forward to doing and working with uh, individuals in the community who are actively involved in beautification, and I noticed that Leslie Juvie is in the audience and she's very actively involved, is to provide educational placards also as to what are you seeing and how can you use these plants in your garden in Geneva? Because these are plants that belong here. The next slide, and I'm gonna try to catch this and pause it, I'm going to, there, I'm going to go back. Oh. This is a fly through of the east parking lot. And what, the reason I stopped it here was this goes to the easement. If, the, if you look at where my mouse is on the, on the screen, the easement that uh, Stephanie is talking about was granted to uh, the city from the then owners of the property for this 20 feet by 40 feet. And it was for ingress and egress only to facilitate traffic coming from Hamilton into the municipal lot and traffic coming from the municipal lot out to Hamilton. This apron is private property. And again, we've used permeable pavers to identify it as private property. There's signage going into the private property. But as I said, we made one critical mistake, and that is by taking down the uh, teller window, the teller, uh, uh, the teller uh, windows, uh, the drive-throughs, we created a street. And so what we have is a serious traffic problem in terms of people driving straight through to get to, second, to get to Third Street. We also know that people sometimes go directly from Second Street to Third Street, and it, does, it interferes with the flow of the traffic. And so our solution is simply uh, in 1981, 1982, when that easement was granted, we request that it be vacated for the overall plan because we're proposing this and that this is a single plan and the idea of having the planter boxes here is these are not homeland security barriers these are resin based planter boxes they're designed so they can be moved they're designed if they're hit they're not going to cost us a fortune to replace if they're concrete and also they don't cause property or personal damage they're separated so that pedestrians and bicycles and wheelchairs can get through them and the and the idea is that if somebody does hit them they're sacrificial it's just, it's a way of creating a very tacit fence. So the, uh, the way the traffic flow is going to be uh, affected, uh, excuse me, uh, gotta go back here, Let's see if I can go back. Hang on. Well, yeah, we're going to back to the beginning here, so we'll try to catch it again. Well, let me see if I can move it forward. I'll sneak it down. There we go. So this is a fly-through of the east, par uh, east parking lot. 
uh, the landscaping you're seeing here is existing. Uh, and what Stephanie didn't say is that Ashland Ventures will be financing the construction and maintenance of the garden park. You'll also notice there's a new knuckle here uh, that was just put in last year by Public Works so that we really have made a beautiful outdoor space and now you can see with the movement of the cars, this was always the intended flow of the lot and we're just making sure we've kind of brought it back to its original intent. Thoughts? Stephanie, I just want to make one comment though. Um, the easement, we're only releasing the ingress, egress Correct. part. There are still, there's still a utility easement yes. there, so we still have our rights protected if we need to access the utilities. Comments or questions? I know that Alderman Bruno. Yes, thank you, Mayor. And uh, thank you, Mr. Kowalik. The, uh, I know we talked about this a long time ago. I'm glad it's coming to fruition. Um, uh, Got to say, I was actually a bit distracted that you just had a running video and you had to time everything to that video. So that's, that's, a, that's a challenge. So good on you for, uh, for doing that. Is that a thing you do? Um, <laughs> I've had, I enjoy public speaking. Oh, okay. <laughs> you just keep practice. But, uh, but no, I'm glad it's coming to fruition and uh, look forward to it. Thanks. You're welcome. Alderman Berger. I'm so glad you're here tonight. Just like Alderman Bruno, I'm glad this is coming well, to fruition. You, you obviously had a real vision for this building and it's been such an asset to the north side of um, Third Street, I mean, to think of, that was a pretty dead area not so long ago, and to have your beautiful repurposed building uh, there, Giamia, all, all the good stuff that's going on there. So I think you really are on the mark in terms of making it a gathering place. Um, I know when I met with you, you talked about you have surveillance video of people doing some pretty dangerous things with the cars yes. going through there. Can you talk a bit about that, about why it's important you feel like to cut off that uh, access? Well, we, we do have, uh, you know, it is, a, it is private property. So the most important thing is we have a liability issue because we have non-customers, non-tenants, non-guests, non-visitors driving through the lot as if it were a street. The second thing is, uh, the video that we do have, and yes, we do have a fairly sophisticated HD night vision camera system, so we are able to see and notice, is this an isolated event? Is this recurring? And uh, I would not want to bet $100,000, but I could say if you asked us to pick any given week and show you samples of video morning, day, and night, you will see people driving through the parking lot, either from the municipal lot or straight from 2nd Street through the parking into our lot. We have tried passive means. We've changed the, sh the size and the shape of the entrance. There's signage coming into it saying municipal lot, private property. Uh, we put a sign if you're exiting the municipal lot. That doesn't help. Yeah, so I, I mean, it seems like this is the right step, and I'm glad the city's seemingly going to be able and to actually, work with you. The, the, the point <clears throat> is the idea originally was, was wonderful because mm -hmm. the the, uh, the existence of the teller windows, did, it wasn't a street. It mm -hmm. was a way to get into a transaction because if you wanted to go through, you were going to be waiting behind a bunch of cars. So it was a transaction point for the bank. It was another way to get in and out of the municipal lot. It was perfect. But that time is over. Mm -hmm. the, the, the teller lanes are down. We have a, a, an arbor. We have people in that arbor. We created a pedway. I can assure you that one of the more interesting things you'd actually see on those videos is the number of people who don't walk on the sidewalk, but they walk on the pedway because it's easier to just make that kind of soft corner and it's, and it's prettier. Mm. Great. Well, thank you. I'm excited about this moving forward. I think forward. it's going to be great. Very good. Thank you. Anyone else on the dais? We have a motion, Mr. Clerk. We have a second. All in favor of item 3A. Please indicate by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Item 3B, related, consider approval of draft resolution number 2019-67, authorizing releasing an ingress-egress easement situated on part of the real property known as 25 North 3rd Street, Geneva, Illinois, 60134. So, so move. second. Bruno then Burghardt? Yep. Is that right? B and B. <laughs> Questions or comments? Thanks for your patience tonight, too. 
All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Great. Congratulations. Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good to see you again. Nice to see you. Item 3C, folks, consider approval of a draft resolution number 2019-68, authorizing execution of a wireline agreement with Union Pacific Railroad for relocation of an existing wireline crossing at Old Kirk Road. Motion by Marks. Second. Seconded by Berghardt. Ms. Dawkins. Sure. The Union Pacific Railroad's third rail mainline project requires the electric utility to replace the crossing of the tracks at a lower elevation than currently exists. Uh, this is the agreement to permit the work to occur. Uh, we do have Hal Wright sitting patiently in the back if you have any additional questions. Questions or comments for either Ms. Dawkins or Superintendent Wright? Hearing none, seeing none, all in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Item 3D, as in David, consider approval of draft resolution number 2019-69, authorizing purchase of a 2019 Ford Transit T350 in the amount of $35,941 and declare a 2002 Chevrolet 3500 box van as a piece of junk. No, as surplus, excuse me. Is there a motion? So move. Motion by Bruno, seconded by McGowan. Questions or comments? Do you want me to? Oh, excuse me, Ms. Dawkins, forgive me. Sure. Um, so the fiscal year 20 budget does have 40000 allocated to replace the sewer televising ban due to years in service and the number of repairs. Uh, so far, $16,195 has been spent in labor and materials in the past five years to keep it operating. Um, there was a question that you saw in the packet about why this isn't part of proposed as part of the lease program, and that has to do with the number of modifications that we do after we get a vehicle and all the aftermarket equipment. If it exceeds a certain percentage, then it's not a good candidate for the lease program. So that's why we're re requesting replacement and then surplusing the old vehicle. Uh, we do have Bob Van Gescom here, our superintendent, to answer any additional questions. Questions from Mr. V or Ms. Dawkins? Seeing none, hearing none, all in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Item 4D passes unanimously. Item 4E is consider approval draft resolution number 2019-70, authorizing waiving of bidding process and purchase of two Siemens variable frequency drives from Steiner Electric at a cost not to exceed 65,496 bucks for the water treatment plant. Is there a motion? So motion by Marks. Second. Seconded by Ruby. Ms. Dawkins. And I am remiss because I didn't write my notes on this one and I've already closed out my computer. Oh, God. <laughs> Mr. Van Gaskin. So, Mr. Van Gaskin has been kind enough to sit around all evening, so I'm sure he would be happy to come up and give you just a brief introduction. My apologies. Put me on the spot. All right. So, uh, we have four individual frequency drives that run the individual RO units at the water plant. We had one that failed, so uh, we are going to go ahead and get that replaced. Uh, currently, we do have Siemens drives, and so we're replacing it with a Siemens drive. We are uh, in the process of trying to get other quotes, but uh, we have not been able to even get a callback from some of these manufacturers. <laughs> Uh, so we're still going to uh, look for other quotes, but a lot of these vendors, the equipment doesn't match, uh, you know, the, the equipment that we have, and we can only match it with uh, similar items. We can't just throw in a uh, Allen Bradley VFD if it doesn't match what our needs are. So uh, we want to get this uh, unit back up and running. So. It's a 13-week uh, lead time right now, so that's why we want to go ahead and uh, have one of the, one as a spare also. So that's where we're at. Questions or comments for the superintendent? Any cues regarding the VFDs? Hearing none, seeing none, all in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? 4E passes unanimously. New business, ladies and gentlemen. 
Anyone in the audience, any comments or questions regarding either tonight's proceedings or any topic at all? From the dais? Alderman McGowan. Thank you, Mayor Burns. Um, we are all aware of the several different power outages that occurred over the weekend, and I know that Public Works staff and city staff worked really hard to get everyone's power back online. So I just want to express my appreciation for all those um, staff members and city employees who worked really hard. So thank you for to those people. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, a motion to adjourn it would be in order. A motion by Alderman Marks. All in favor of adjourning, please say aye. Aye. aye.